Well, Sue, I've had a complaint from a listener. Really? Yeah. That doesn't surprise me whatsoever. He says, I've got to stop throwing you under the bus. Excellent. Because <laughs> you are so mean to me on air, because it's like you're a talkback radio host and you have the mic. Well, it's not just that I have the mic, I have the editing. Exactly. So I can cut out all my mistakes and leave yours in. That's right. And and, but you have fair, a fan out there who doesn't want us to do that anymore. Or who feels sorry for me. That's excellent. Good news. So um, this week we're going to be talking about the building commissioner. Yeah, I hear you had a meeting with him. And? Coronavirus in Coronavirus apartments. Coronavirus in, in apartments. Mm. And other stuff. I'm Jimmy Thompson. And I'm Sue Williams. And this is the Flat Chat Wrap. meeting with the building commissioner David Chandler this week. Well, yes, and um, very interesting it was too. He's, uh, his plans, which I have to say I was less than supportive of in the Flat Chat website recently, um, actually kind of makes sense. Really? Well, what kind of plans? Well, he's talking about basically the way he puts it is you've got 20% of developers are cowboys. And 20% are kind of marginal, and the other 60% are good. And probably we're talking of in terms of the, the number of apartments that these people build rather than the number of companies. Right. And he says if you can identify the bottom 20 and clean them out, the next 20% will get their act together. Well, that's reasonable. But the, the trouble is you only tend to find out who are the bad builders when they've actually finished building their apartments and they're riddled with defects and... Then they go into liquidation so that nobody can get any funds back. Exactly. So what he's doing is saying, you know this thing they were going to do like a, a rating system for developers? Yeah. He's saying, well, what you do is you check on, you know, if a developer has a bad record, if the certifier has a bad record, if the builder has a bad record, you put all those together, you know, even the architect or the engineers, you just put, if there are too many black dots against their names, you go, well, these people need to be investigated more closely. Mm. And so then what they do is they they go with the, the certificate of occupancy and say, hey, if you want a certificate of occupancy, you've got to tick all these boxes. You've got to have the building has to be sound, the waterproofing has to be sound, the fire safety has to be in place, even the acoustics. Oh, and who checks all that? Well, because they're only looking at uh, the bottom 20%, they are going to build an army of uh, inspectors. inspectors who will go to the certifiers and say, you know, don't just sign off because the plumber says, here's a certificate, uh, I promise I did everything right. Go and look at stuff. Well, that's unusual because certifiers don't really look at stuff, do they? they certifiers don't want to. They don't want to go in the building. <laughs> they, mm. They're told on a lot of occasions not to go in the building. And mm. and so what they, what he's saying is, if you don't do your job properly, if everybody doesn't do their job adequately, you don't get a certificate of occupation or occupancy, which means you cannot sell the apartment. It so it's kind of like a karma army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not a balmy army. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they um and so the developers have to give the investors their money, their deposit back. And they've got a building that they can't sell. Wow. That would sort them out pretty quickly, so wouldn't it? It would. I mean all this requires well he's saying it's not it doesn't require any changes in the legislation. It just requires the government to decide we're going to enforce the legislation. And then they've got to fund it, though, haven't they? Because they've got to fund the extra people. Well, yeah, that's where you know that's where I suppose the first sticking point would be. But how many kind of people is he thinking of in this army? Probably thirty. Thirty. Oh, 30. that's not that many, is it? No, but then he's not looking at every building in. Yeah, sure. So I mean, it's it's quite manageable financially, really. Yeah, I, I think it's it sounds much more practical than I thought. Mm. I mean, I thought it was going to be like TripAdvisor. You know, you'd have people say, oh, yeah, one of the other elements in the checking on the, the who's who's a cowboy and who isn't is um, consumer reports. 
Like if there'd been lots of consumer reports of complaints about this building or this developer, it might not be the building they're looking at, it might be the previous building. And they go, well, this person has a terrible track record. But will people be prepared to report on their buildings because they don't want the value of their buildings to be compromised? That's always a problem. But I think people will write to Fair Trading and say, I've got terrible problems in my building, can you help me? And Fair Trading will say, no, nah, not really. <laughs> Computer says no. Yeah. <laughs> but then they'll Fair have Trading a will say, this is what the legislation says about your problem. <laughs> <laughs> but then they'll have that as a record and they'll take that into yeah, consideration. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. And did he seem like a really determined guy? I mean... Very. Yeah? Yeah, a really sort of gung-ho kind of I'm going to get stuff done person. Yeah, because he's an academic, isn't he? He was, yeah. yeah. So you kind of think academics will just want to write papers and not really do anything really practical, but you, you had the opposite impression. Very much so. I mean, he's... He's older than me. Oh, God, he's ancient. <laughs> <laughs> but has, I'd probably say, more energy. But uh, no, really kind of got the bit between his teeth. He's, and he's given himself a deadline of three years. He reckons there's going to be something like 5,000 new strata schemes will come online in the next three years. Is that New South Wales or Australia? New South Wales. In New South Wales. He's only New South Wales. So, but presumably, if this model starts um, showing real results, other states might even adopt it too. I think that's kind of, you know, he's not, that's not a stated aim, but I think it's kind of in the back of his mind he would like to change the whole business. Because if you can establish a successful template. And the other thing is insurance. I mean, we, we know that the, some of the big uh, developers are already saying, we'll give you 10-year building insurance. Like they've just gone and done it because there's so little faith in the apartment building industry at the moment. And they want to distinguish themselves from the bad buildings. Yeah. So what he, I think, is aiming for is that the insurers will come in and say, look, these people have a good track record and there's that's good business for us. So we will start insuring buildings again. And then once again, you've got that probably the lower and middle section of developers who are not getting insured. And what would you do as a, as a purchaser? I wouldn't buy those. I'd buy the yeah. insurance ones, even if they're a bit more expensive, yeah. because you know, hopefully they're going to be better quality. Exactly. So it kind of brings buildings back into line with kind of cons regular consumer legislation, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, look, the whole building development industry has been such a rot for so long, and politicians, maybe not this generation, but the last bunch should really hang their heads in shame what they've allowed to happen. Not just allowed, encouraged. With self-certification. And all that stuff. No insurance over a certain height. Yep. And while you were away in Mumbai, while you were away in India... Filing look, stories for your flat chain. Yeah, absolutely. There's a fantastic story there about the most self-indulgent, expensive apartment. It's also an apartment block. It's a self-contained apartment in its own whole apartment block. Um, Which is the most expensive home in the whole world. I'm not surprised. I mean, it's, mm. it's about 12 stories, isn't it? And 27 stories. 27 stories, and it's one home. <laughs> one home. They have to their a family own... of five. That's kind of disgusting, really, isn't it? Is it is, really. And yeah. the building is one of it the is. ugliest buildings <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. It's like somebody got their kid to put it together with Lego and then <laughs> said, go and build it. Here's... Half a billion pounds. Apparently it's pretty incredible inside. They oh, yeah. allowed Forbes in there to see it. And, of course, it's very high-quality finishes. Yeah. And uh, it's quite magnificent. And the views out are quite splendid. Fabulous part of Mumbai City. Yeah. But um, well, that's India, really. It's fabulous wealth and, you know, horrendous poverty. And it's just the two extremes all the time. Built on the site of an orphanage. Yes. <laughs> a hint of irony. And this story is on the Flat Chat website, folks, if you haven't caught up with that already. So while you were in India, you sent very kindly sent me a story from, I think, the Australian about the New South Wales Liberal Party and uh, developers and how they're going to stop them being able to stand for election. And it's really interesting how, the, how there's this division within the, the Liberal Party, which has always been seen as, you know, the, biz, the party of business, where somebody proposed that the Liberal Party not nominate any developers for local council seats. 
and some faction within the Liberal Party stopped that from happening. So the same people said, well, OK, let's put this up to Parliament and make it that no party can have developers in local councils. And I, th- I don't know if that's gone through, but I think it's it's going through. And what a fantastic step forward. Mm, yeah. I mean, I didn't realise that developers stood for local councils, really. <sighs> Well, there's a few notorious cases, if you oh, think, recently. Oh, yes, yeah. Sally in the hair. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Of yeah, course. they get on there and then they start... And they do deals with... One developer will say, oh, this this is my development that's coming up for consideration. I'll leave the room while you debate it, knowing that their mate, who's actually a business rival, will support them. And then they, it's quid pro quo. They do the same for them. It is so profoundly and fundamentally corrupt it's amazing that he here and now in 2020 we're only getting to grips with that Mm. and there's there's the root there's the root of all the problems of crappy buildings and people being cheated out of their their uh, money you know it's It's enmeshed in the political system really yeah quite apart from politicians getting so much stamp duty and all that kind of thing well, not the politicians. Well, the government. Yeah, sorry, the government. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but I just discovered last week that this very building in which we sit, when, when it was taken over uh, from the original developer by a Singaporean company, the first thing they did was to take eight million dollars out of the budget and put it in the bank, which is why the finishes on the upper floor are not quite as good as the ones on the really? lower floors. Wow! I didn't know that. Uh, so yeah, so so David Chandler's really trying to get stuff done. And I hear you suggested him doing a podcast with him. I did. Me. Well, you could do it too. <laughs> we could have the three. Maybe of us. David and I will just cut you out of the loop, Jimmy. Jeez. <laughs> I wish I'd never agreed not to throw you under the bus again. <laughs> but that would be good. Is that's going to be in a few weeks? Then. Yeah. But in the meantime, there's a very lengthy, comprehensive summary of the meeting I had with him last week, uh, which uh, it's pretty interesting. I find it interesting. And that's on your website. That's on the website. Flat-chat.com.au. And it even talks about possibly in the future creating a duty of care for apartment owners. So your owner's corporation can't just say, oh, these are the repairs we might need to do in the next few years. They actually have to do them. Fantastic. So that buildings aren't allowed to just deteriorate over, you know, a few years. Well, I'm feeling a lot more optimistic now. Well, there you go. That's why I'm here, to cheer you up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) After this, we're going to be talking about coronavirus. And we're back. Sue, you've been... Finding out all about coronavirus and and apartment blocks and the gym and stuff like that. What's going on? Well, I mean, as we all know, really, coronavirus is having a fundamental effect on nearly every aspect of our lives and in apartments, perhaps even more than most. Right. Because, first of all, um, I was doing a story today about how there are dire shortages of materials and products being used for the building and construction industry making apartments because most of those components come from China. They're oh, manufactured right. in China. And that's cladding, you know. Oh, we know bad. about that. Yeah, <laughs> they can keep that. <laughs> yeah. Glass. Oh, yeah. um, you know, all, all the kind of materials that were used in apartment buildings, mo- many of them these days come from China because they're able to supply on a mass basis, a right. huge scale, and they're often much cheaper than alternative products as well. Yeah. And because of coronavirus... The Chinese, during the Lunar New Year, they they closed down their factories. And then because of the virus, they never really opened them again. They kept them closed for a while and then a bit longer, then a bit longer. And nobody actually knows when they're going to open. And now over here, we're suffering real real kind of scarcities of supplies. Right. Traders are reporting that even, you know, nuts and screws they just can't get hold of. The stuff that they would normally go into Bunnings and pick up easily, there are actually shortages of those materials. Wow. But there's always a silver lining in these cases. I was talking today to the National Executive of the Urban Development Institute of Australia, and she was saying, well, the thing is a lot of the big companies, big development companies, were actually preparing for the possibility of a a, a trade war with China, you know, after the US. 
And um, so they were making provisions and contingency plans to, to source some of those materials and products from other countries yeah. and even sometimes from Australia. Oh. So they're actually some of them are putting those plans into place now and trying to get alternatives from, from Europe or from emerging economies and even sort of helping some industries in Australia. So maybe sometimes that's going to be a good news story for Australian products, really. Yeah. Because yeah. while they'll probably be a little bit more expensive to source, yeah. other people say, well, the quality is perhaps better than some of the you know Asian products, and it may give a little bit of a kick to our economy because... As we know, the coronavirus is really incredibly bad for our economy and for the global economy completely. Yeah, I just had a slightly off the wall thought, but one of the things we know about is the students being kept out of, you know, like Chinese students being told that they can't come here. And I'm thinking about all these overcrowded flats. I mean, they they don't plan to come here and stay in an overcrowded flat, but when they get here, they're somehow tricked into thinking that's the only way they can stay. Can you imagine some of these overcrowded apartments with, mm. you know, 12 students in a two-bedroom apartment and one of them's got the virus? <gasps> They'd be Petri dishes, wouldn't they, really? Well, they are, yeah. They'd mm. be worse than a cruise ship. Mm, absolutely. Mm. And I, I think um, you were talking about some of the apartment buildings in China, how, how they're faring with the, the coronavirus as well. Yeah, somebody told me, I think it was on the TV, um, that the in the area, which I can never remember the name of, which is hardest hit, Wuhan, Wuhan the people are told, you know, that they've got to stay in their apartments. They can't come out. And so they put a guard on the front door of the apartment block. And if you want to get food delivered, which they they do. You do. You order the food and the guy rides up on his bicycle and parts the bicycle and then goes away, walks away 20 metres. And then you have to come down and get the food and take it back in. And there's a thing on the bicycle, on the food, saying that the delivery driver's temperature was this when he left. the. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible, isn't it? But it's hard, you know, in high-density living, um, when you get a virus like this, it's really quite difficult because... You, if you are in an apartment building and you are self-isolating, as a lot yeah. of people are having to do, then how do you get food delivered? You know, can you get it delivered to your actual apartment, or does it have to go to the lobby and you have to go down and pick it out from the lobby, or you know, from the mailboxes, or mm. from the concierge? The concierge probably wouldn't be very happy about handing you stuff. It's it's really really difficult, isn't it? It's. I noticed that our building has a hand sanitizer on the front desk now. Which is great. It's fine. But, you know, you think about all these things. They, they, basically, they're saying the way it transmits it isn't so much... I'm sure coughs and sneezes have part of the thing, but it seems to be people coughing into their hands and then shaking hands or touching other people or touching a surface that someone else touches and then that person touches their face. And it it's so hard, you know, you, you especially for Australians. We shake hands all the time. Mm. I went to shake someone's hand the other day and they kind of pulled away. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, whoops. oh yes, okay. Yeah. And we, we touched fists. Yes. So um, I've got a, it's another article in the, the Flat Chat website, fist bumping, because this time last year I called up the health department media section and said, you should start a campaign fist bump for flu season. Because old, older people will not fist bump. You know, they shake hands. They want to shake hands. That's mm. the way they've been brought up. They do it instinctively. And older people suffer most from flu. And I said, you should get them to fist bump for flu season. You'll save a lot of lives. And the woman actually laughed at me. <gasps> she said, oh, you do it. If you want it, you do it. I bet she's laughing on the other side I of her face now. Do you she's know? either laughing or coughing. It's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. yeah, the, the fist bumping and, and foot tapping and knee nudging and elbow mm. bumping. Mm. But I think I like fist bump because... It keeps the other person at two arm lengths away from you. That's right. But I think men have to be a bit careful when they fist bump women because when I did it the other day, it was with a quite a big guy. Yeah. And he actually kind of he punched jabbed you. me. <laughs> and I wasn't quite ready for it. Otherwise, uh, I would have hit him back. But yeah. I, I just kind of put it my hand there like the queen yeah. or something. Really. Right. And he just jabbed me and it yeah. actually quite hurt. So I have to be aware of that, I think, in future. That's a picture I want to see, the Queen fist bumping. <laughs> yes. Well, she wear, probably still gone back to wearing gloves, hasn't she, really? The, one of the interesting things about this, and one of the stupid interesting things about this coronavirus thing is the, the toilet roll thing. 
Mm. Well, yeah. And even going back to apartments, uh, gyms, apartment gyms. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think some people are getting a bit paranoid about, about you know, touching surfaces, yep. Yep. using barbells, using weights yep. um, on machines and things. Yep. But, you know, a lot of people do wear gloves. Yes. Um, but I went to the gym tonight and it was quite full. Nobody seemed to be bothered at all, which was a, right. a nice thing, really. But a lot of gyms do have wipes. Yes. Um, although people say, well, you should check on what's actually in the wipe. You yeah. know, maybe they don't have the right amount of alcohol to to clean equipment properly. Right. Really. And I think when I meant to, said that to you, you suggested splashing vodka on everything. But I don't I've, know I've, seen, I've since done some research and there isn't enough alcohol in vodka to clean <laughs> a surface. <laughs> Vodka tends to be about 40%, and you need about 65 to 70% alcohol. Wow. That is a different kind of alcohol anyway. Mm, yeah. And it could encourage people to lick surfaces. <laughs> so it's Go just not a good idea. A yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're back. And... This week we've got a new section of something, it's an idea that I've stolen from NPR's or their podcast, their politics podcast in America. They call it Can't Let It Go. It's little things that have stuck with you during the week. We're going to call it Hey Martha, um, which it used to be the name for the last bit on the end of the, the news broadcast where you'd show you some funny video of a kitten or something. So this is our very first Hey Martha section. What have you got, Sue? Sorry to go back to India, but the Indian newspapers were full of Australia on page three and page five, all about toilet paper. Really? That's how I found out about it. It was incredible, the coverage. Indians just loved the idea of Australians running out of toilet paper, I think. They were most amused. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can see the irony in that. Well, yeah. I mean, I found it quite astonishing. I mean, there was a there was a little thing on Facebook, a picture of three men and underneath it said this is how Australians are protecting themselves against coronavirus and the men were just wrapped in toilet paper (laughs) yes that seems to be it really but not many other countries are going as berserk about toilet paper as we are I mean in the states yeah um, there was a a couple from the states who was were on my trip yeah and their daughter had bought 180 rolls of toilet paper and they thought she was quite mad yeah um So it just seems that it's a particularly Australian thing. It's weird, isn't it, really? I don't know what the... I mean, it's not like that one of the um, symptoms of coronavirus (laughs) is constantly running to the toilet. No. But of all the things that you would think of that uh, you might run out of that would be difficult to deal with, Mm. toilet paper... Yeah. yeah, a couple of extra rolls would probably do it. But, you know, you hear about... I mean, there was a case the other day of a woman coming up to the, the checkout with her shopping trolley absolutely stacked with every last packet of toilet roll. And this other woman came up and said, look, please, can I just have one packet? And the woman with all the toilet rolls said, no, you should have got here earlier. And I think they ended up fisticuffs. Oh, no. It brings out the worst in people. And the very best in some people. Mm. I mean, you've come across a couple of things, um, strange offers that people are making. Yeah, because as as you know, travel has been really, really terribly hit. And I do a lot of travel writing. And uh, one of the cruise companies is now offering um, a cut price cruise with a very special offering, unlimited free toilet paper. Oh, terrific. <laughs> so, yeah. So and, that's... and you saw a sign in, uh, in a... Uh, Yes, a friend sent me a sign that she'd, she'd taken a picture of, uh, a church in Queensland, and on the front billboard it said, let us pray for more toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's just becoming a national obsession, really, it isn't is. it? Uh, somebody said that the NT News uh, printed the eight middle pages of its paper the other day blank so people could use it, <laughs> <laughs> which saves on journalist costs as well, I think. Mm. Um, and there's a... Curry restaurant in Glasgow uh, that's offering free curries to anybody who is quarantined for two weeks. Two weeks free curry every day will be delivered if you've been quarantined. That's really nice of them. Yeah, to cheer them up. Yeah. I wonder if they'll need extra toilet paper. (laughs) 
Well, that's that's an offer that really wouldn't appeal to my mother. As you know, right. she came to India with me. Yes. She wasn't so keen on the food, but she tried. She battled valiantly. Right. But terribly. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't laugh at all. But when we came back, we came back via Singapore, and she got a little bit of a sore throat. Right. And she said, oh, no, it's nothing. I always get a little bit of a sore throat when I travel. Yeah. Because you know, she doesn't drink enough water and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so when we came home, she went to her doctor... <laughs> The doctor, the first thing he said to her was, have you been overseas lately? And she said, well, yes, I've just come back from India. And he said, oh, India's okay. He said, how did you come back? She said, oh, via Singapore. He said, oh, how long did you spend in Singapore? And she said, two hours, because it was just two hours at the airport. And he said, okay, I'm afraid you're going to have to (laughs) (laughs) self-isolate. So she, in her retirement village, is now stuck at home. And she said, oh, it doesn't matter because... My dad can go out and do the shopping for her until my brother pointed out, well, that's not really the point. The point that's is not that, self-isolation. No, that's right. He should be isolating himself as well. So oh, my God. She's very fed up, Maybe as stuck you can at imagine. Home yes. Doing jigsaws or something. That's right. <laughs> and the final note, you may have heard of this, you may have seen it already. We've got it on our website uh, on the story about fist bumping. The video of the American health expert saying you mustn't touch your face if you don't want to spread the virus and as she turns a page to read the next page she licks her finger (laughs) (laughs) and on that note thank you so much sir for coming in pleasure jimmy and we'll talk to you again next week bye bye If you enjoy these podcasts, and would you still be listening if you didn't, you can subscribe free of charge on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and lots of other podcast platforms. As I said, it's free of charge, and that means the podcast will be delivered directly to your phone, laptop, or computer as soon as it's published. You'll find links at the end of the show notes, that's the related story, on the Flat Chat website. And the website is where you go to find the stories we've been discussing today, as well as about 10 years of archives and, of course, your questions and answers on the Flat Chat forum. Just log in to flat-chat.com.au to ask a question or, even better, answer someone else's. Okay, thanks for listening. Talk to you again soon.